When you talk about the, the Eagles, especially the Super Bowl this year and everything, they get really crazy. Uh, unfortunately, guys, unfortunately, listen, there's always next year for us, right? <laughs> always next year. That seems to be the theme for us quite a bit, doesn't it? It's all right. We'll still have fun watching it and watching the commercials tonight and everything. Man, it's so good to be with you guys today. So good to be able to hang out with you during this Family Matters series. I know you guys had a good friend of mine, uh, Pastor Lamoris Crawford, here last week. Wasn't he awesome? Wasn't that so good? <clears throat> so, uh, man, I, I never like to follow up Lamoris because, my goodness, he's, a, he's unbelievable. He's a good friend of ours, too, in the ministry that we do. If I haven't gotten a chance to meet you, my name is Davey. And uh, I've been here a few times, and it's so good to be back with you guys. It feels like family, and I'm glad to be able to minister with you. What I get to do full-time is I lead a ministry called Nothing is Wasted Ministries. We help people in trauma, tragedy, and major life transition, and uh, we help people discover purpose in their pain. And so I spend most of my time traveling and speaking at different churches all over the country and um, around Indianapolis, and it's just a joy to be able to see different expressions of God's kingdom and it's always a joy to be back here. Can I give you a quick update and tell you what's going on with our ministry a little bit? I'll talk a little bit about our family today, too, because we're in a series about family. And, um, but one some cool stuff that's going on with our ministry right now is God is opening up some huge doors. And it's only by the grace of God. But we have begun partnering with some church network organizations to launch our course, Pain to Purpose, in churches all over the country. In fact, one of those organizations, you guys, whether you know it or not, you're very, your DNA is very familiar with this. It's ARC, Association of Related Churches. They plant churches all over, all over the world and uh, Grow Network. And so your pastor goes to Grow Conference just about every year, takes a team there. And so we are actually partnered with them. It looks like we're going to be stepping into um, about a, a thousand plus churches over the next year or two. So praise God. But I'll say this, um, you know, growth can be just as much a curse as it, as it is a blessing. And so I, I just ask for your prayers that we would steward that well. Uh, we don't want to get out ahead of God. We don't want to lag behind what God is doing. And so we're in a critical stage in our ministry right now where we're trying to figure out how to make sure our infrastructure is solid to be able to serve these churches in this way. And so uh, just a little update so you guys can keep us, our family, our ministry, and your prayers. And I'll keep updating you as I continue to come back here. I'll be back in November so it'll be a lot of fun to be able to spend some time with you in November as well. Um, are you guys ready to dive into today? I was asked to talk about parenting today. And I was like, Pastor Craig, please, can I talk about something else, right? And he was like, well, you know, when we went out to, to lunch with you guys last time, your kids were so well behaved. I was like, I, they have you fooled too then, huh? Isn't that always true, right? Like your kids are the most well-behaved for other people. You, you pick them up from school. You, pick, you have parent-teacher conference. We just had ours. And they're like, your kids are amazing. I'm like, Where, what kids are you talking about? Did we switch them up or something? And so he's like, I'd love for you to talk about parenting. And so I want you to understand in here today, like the verdict's still out on us, okay? We're like, <laughs> when my kids are 30, they're out of the house. Praise God for the empty nest season, right? My kids are going to be out of my house when they are 30. We're not talking about kids living in my basement, right? I mean, I love them right now, but I'm, gonna try, I'm trying to grow my kids up, okay? Get them out of the house, make them contributing members of society. When they are, and if they're still loving Jesus, and they're still serving people, and they are actually contributing members of society, then you can come to me and you can ask for advice, all right? We'll talk about it then. Uh, so I need you to understand, like, I am certainly by no means an expert at this concept of parenting. By no means. I might get passionate today and excited about some of the things I'm talking about, because I'm in the thick of it. Nine, eight, and three, those are the ages of our kids. <laughs> and they're all firstborns. So, and then my wife and I, we are very intense personalities ourselves, and we have two dogs that happen to be alphas as well, a Great Pyrenees and a Miniature Dachshund, okay? We have chaos in our household. Everyone is trying to fight for alpha, all right? And so, look, we don't have it all figured out. It, most days it feels like chaotic, but we are learning some principles, and we actually sit in a unique position because if many of you guys know our story. You know, I lost my late wife when my son, my eight-year-old son now was 15 months old. And then Christy and I got married and our daughter is nine and she comes from Christy's previous marriage that ended in a painful divorce. And then our three-year-old is ours together. So we have yours, mine, and ours. That's why they're all firstborns. And we, we have a blended family. And so we have the unique position where we sit in, where we're in co-parenting situations, okay? Where Natalia's dad is very much involved in, in our life and her life. And where we have a situation where we're trying to parent 
a son who um, has a, is emerging from trauma after grief and loss, and then one that's just ours but is crazy, okay? <laughs> like, just absolutely crazy. And so I just, I just wanna kind of share some of those struggles, but here's what I really wanna do. I really wanna talk more about how God parents us because I believe that we can look in scripture and we can see some ancient principles that will help us to understand how God parents us. So if you're not a parent in here, okay, or if you're kind of out of that season and maybe you're not like in the, in the midst of it right now, I'm hoping that this will still be really valuable to you because you'll begin to see God as a father in a different way and how God grows us up and how God parents us. And so I wanna, I wanna talk about this for a second, okay? First of all, how many, uh, I'll just share with you, I got dogs. How many dog owners in here? Come on, praise God, all right. Love dogs. How many cat owners in here? Okay, I see that hand. Okay, you can come forward, please come forward. We will have a nice <laughs> salvation call. I understand, but I'm just kidding. How many of you guys own fish? You got fish? Okay, not a whole lot of you, all right? It's not a bad thing if you own fish. I just don't own fish, okay? I'm not really a cat lover, although I'm seeing the benefits of cats, because we've got mice around our house right now. We live near Traders Point Creamery and we got a lot of field mice that come in. I'm like, maybe we should get a cat. That's what, I never thought I'd say that. But we've got two dogs and you know, and so, but I've never owned fish. And I think partially it's because I've never been able to keep fish alive. Just being honest with you, okay? Now I attribute that to the fact that when I was young, I named my first fish Adam and Eve. And I think the curse of sin just kind of entered in and fractured everything. <laughs> And now it's just this ever increasing unraveling and fish ownership for me. But I'll go to the state fair and I'll win something for my kids and I can't keep the fish alive for like any more than a week. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is, okay? Adam and Eve, originally they tasted the, the, the uh, wrong food or something. I, like, and now it's got, just hopeless. But what I know about fish is this. I know that fish have to survive in a certain climate, a certain environment, don't they? You're never gonna see a fish, I'm sorry, for those of you guys who love Disney, I know that your pastor and his wife love Disney, but Ariel is not real. Okay, I wanna be where the people are. You know, like that's not, no fish is gonna be like, can, you know what, I, I would just love if I could, you know, I feel so constricted and confined in this liquid. I just, I'd like to be out of it because if you take a fish out of the environment it was created to be in, it's floundering, okay, no pun intended. It's just flopping around. It is not going to survive, right? I need you to understand this. God has created us in a particular and certain way. And when God created us, wired us a particular certain way, he also wired the universe to work in a particular way. That when we are aligned with the way the universe works, with the way God wired the universe to work, then, then we find the fullness of joy and the fullness of who God created us to be. And so what God did when sin fractured the world, entered the world, God began to create some, what we call in scripture, commands, okay? Or boundaries. Some people think of them as restrictions or rules, right? Some people are like, man, God's trying to take my fun away from me, okay? And can we be honest? Walking outside of God's ways, it can feel fun, right? My grandma's like, man, sinning's not fun. And I'm like, grandma, have you not, you're not doing it right, okay? Like, <laughs> scripture even says, Sin is pleasurable for a season, but ultimately it leads to death because we as the created order, the created beings, we were not meant to operate outside of the created order. And so God has put some boundaries around us to say, hey, if you operate in this right here, you will experience the fullness of joy. Outside of us, you will experience pain, you will experience destruction, you will experience a deterioration of your soul. And so these commands are always there for our good. In fact, the very first man and woman, God said, Adam and Eve, you are the first words he said to creation. You are free, hear me? God wants for you and I to have freedom. Freedom from what, Davey? Freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from anxiety, freedom from depression, freedom from unnecessary heartache and pain, right? There is, because we live in the fallen, a fallen world, there is going to be pain in this world. Jesus said, there will be sorrow. But there can't, listen, a lot of the pain we experience is avoidable pain because if we stay inside of the confines that God has created us to, walk, to operate in, then we experience fulfillment, we experience joy. I need you to understand that parenting is very similar. 
You see, today's day and age, I've heard so many different parenting philosophies, right? We don't wanna make, we wanna make sure our kids don't experience any kind of pain, any kind of discipline, any kind of, like, we just, we don't wanna tell our kids no. Can I tell you something? Not telling your kid no is like taking a fish outside of the environment that they are meant to thrive in, putting them on earth, on land, and expecting them to thrive. I need you to hear me say this. Just like if, if there's nothing else that you get in here. If you want to bless your kids, you can't always say yes to your kids. This is true for us in our relationship with God too. Many of you guys are asking God for something in your life. You're asking, and God has seemingly disappointed you because he hasn't given to you what you want. And there's so many layers to this, right? James, the brother of Jesus, actually said, well, God, God you know, you don't have because you don't ask. So, but if you're asking, sometimes you don't have because you're asking with wrong motives to spend what you want on your own desires. By the way, can you imagine being the brother of Jesus, right? The pressure that you feel in that family. Let's go. You bring your report card home and your mom's like, I mean, can you, why can't you just be more like your brother, James? Come on. <laughs> oh, thanks, mom. We're all trying to be like Jesus. Okay, right? <sighs> you know? And he says, listen, you, you, you don't have because you don't ask, but when you ask, you ask for wrong motives. And some of you are disappointed and disenfranchised by God because you're going, God, you didn't show up for me the way that I thought you would show up for me. You didn't give me what I thought that you were supposed to give me. And listen to me, I'm telling you, if God had given that to you, it wouldn't be a blessing in your life, it'd be a curse. Because he knows. He knows what your life can hold. He knows what your life can handle. He knows what will happen to you in your being, in your soul, if he gives you that, because it will lead to destruction, not to blessing. And, and listen to me, our kids, if you're a parent here, you've got to understand, if you say yes to your kids for everything, you constantly say yes, it's not going to be a blessing. No sometimes is the greatest gift that you can give your kids. And so what we have to do as parents is we have to figure out how do we create and cultivate an environment where they can come to know and love the Lord and follow after Jesus. Isn't that the goal, right? To grow them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Now, I hate to break it to you. You cannot control your child's experience with God. You can't control it. I wish you could. I really do. One of our kids right now, we are just, they're at a very critical age and we're seeing a lot of behavior that's going on right now and we're going, Okay, this could be really bad if God doesn't get a hold of their heart. And so we spend more time on our knees now praying, begging God, God, would you just get a hold? Would you just get a hold of their heart? Would you just get a hold of their heart? Would you just regenerate the heart? But I need you to understand that we've got to start with this assumption. Before we can move on, we've got to start with this understanding. And that is that, that kids, by default, are apart from God. They are separated from God. They are sinful from birth. Hear me? So are you. David said in Psalm 51, he said, surely I was sinful, even from birth. You don't believe me? Because most people, I mean, they're like, I don't know, my kid was an angel, right? You think your kid's just so beautiful coming out. No, no, your kid looked like E.T. made it with a cone head coming out, okay? <laughs> and on top of that, your kid did not come out trying to figure out how to convenience mom and dad. Like, God, oh, <laughs> mom, how can I make your life easy today, right? That's not what happened. Came out crying naked with an attitude. They're sinners, <laughs> separated from God, going to hell, right? We gotta pray for them, okay? And some, listen, some of you are offended that I just said that. But you know, and you've got to understand, you've gotta start with that presupposition. You have to understand that our kids are, by default, by nature, separated from God. And what they need most, more than anything else, more than parenting tricks, parenting hacks, more than anything else, is they need a saving relationship with an almighty God. They need to understand who they are in Christ. They need their heart regenerated. They need their heart to come alive and awaken to the idea that God loves them so much that he gave his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for them, to become the propitiation of sin for them and raised from the dead. <clears throat> And then now they don't have to live under the curse of sin. They can be victorious in the midst of all that they're walking through. And can we be honest, man, what they are walking through these days, oh my gosh. 
what our kids are being exposed to, what they're privy to these days, the struggles and challenges that kids and teenagers have these days far supersede the challenges that I even had as a teenager. I'm almost 40 years old. So it's been, I mean, I may not look it, but I, it's been, you know, 25 plus years that I've been a kid or a teenager. And the world has drastically changed. And so this thing right here, God's word, is the only thing that will be pervasive through all the changes of culture. We can't be tossed to and fro with the changes of culture and go, well, okay, maybe how do we, how do we parent here? How do we? No, we've got to go back to the ancient text that is transcendent beyond all changes of culture, God's word, and go, okay, how are we to parent our kids and how does God parent us? That's what we want to talk about today. So how does God parent us? Okay, well, the first way that God parents us is in unity. In unity. Unity. I want to talk about a guy named Jacob a little bit today. We'll do a little flyover, some kind of pull some sections out of his life. Because Jacob, <clears throat> he had a lot of parenting struggles. Okay? Did you know that the Bible is full of people who aren't perfect? Come on. Praise God. Our Bible heroes are not perfect people that we put up on a pedestal and go, oh, I want to just emulate them. You don't want to emulate them. <laughs> The Bible is not a book full of people that are heroes that we want to emulate. The Bible is full of stories of people who are broken, fallen, make mistakes, sinful, but God shows up and redeems their story. Come on. And so Jacob, in Genesis chapter 37, it says in 17, verse 17, so Joseph, who was Jacob's favorite son, right? Jacob had, had a favorite. Don't, don't admit this. You probably have a favorite, I'm just saying, I don't have fit. <clears throat> some are easier than others on some days, right? Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. Now, there were several brothers, okay? He had, he had 11 brothers at this moment right here, but, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Okay, you think your family's dysfunctional. You might be, but more than likely, you're not dealing with this kind of dysfunction right here, okay? There are so many complexities within the family, within Jacob's family, and at one point, all of the brothers wanted to kill Joseph because Joseph was the favorite. And one of the things that we can begin to learn as we peer into Jacob's life is we can begin to learn, okay, what are the mistakes that Jacob made, all right? By the way, throughout all the mistakes that Jacob made, his kids became the namesake for all of the tribes of Israel, okay? God chose to use this messed up family, praise God, this messed up family to be the hope for the world. Bless them to be a blessing. So if you were in here, you're like, man, I just feel like our family is just so dysfunctional, it's just too far gone. Listen to me, you, you can be restored. God's got a plan for your life and for your family. Okay, but we first have to understand God's going to parent us in unity, in unity. You ever felt like you were not aligned as a family, not in unity as a family? We have discussions a lot at my house about whether our kids are going to play sports or whether they're going to, you know, work or how many sports they're going to play. Like if it was up to me, my kids would be in all kinds of sports, all kinds of extracurricular activities. We'd have them in music. We'd have them in three sports in one season, right? We'd have them doing all this kind of fun stuff right here. For up to my wife, we would do no sports, uh, maybe one per season, and, you know, uh, just kind of take it a lot easier and a little bit, little bit more slower pace. So we compromise as a family, and we only do one sport. <coughs> um, <laughs> you there? You've been there before? You know, we're trying to find alignment. When we don't find alignment as a family, things can go awry. I'll never forget with my late wife, we were taking a trip to go visit some friends and we had packed up all of these, this suitcase to go visit them over a weekend. We were actually going to uh, invite people to come with us, to move with us to Indianapolis to plant the church that we, plant, that we were planting at the time. So we went to go visit some friends in Virginia. We were living in South Carolina at the time. We pack, we pack up all of our luggage and stuff. We get in the car and we drive. We get to Virginia. It was about six hours away. And, and, and I go to the back, to the, you know, the trunk to try to get our luggage out and the luggage isn't in there. My late wife's name was Amanda. I said, Amanda, I thought you put the luggage in the, she goes, I thought you put the luggage in there. 
I'm like, wait a minute. She's like, that's your job. I'm like, no, that was your, because I was doing this thing and I thought that you and, and we made all of these assumptions and we were not on the same page. When you're not on the same page, you're going to show up on your trip without your luggage, okay? <laughs> Things can go majorly awry. And I need you to understand that God parents us in unity and you and I have to parent in unity as well. You know that your kids know how to angle and get in between you and your spouse. You know that? My kids are already doing it. Coming to me going, hey, hey, can I do this? Can I have this? And I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like something. I'm like, did you check with your mom first? Well, no, but you know, and I'm like, oh, you came to me because you knew that I was the lenient one. And then I would probably say yes when mom would say no, right? And so we like, we caught him, you know? I knew how to do that as a kid. I knew exactly how to make sure that I get in there. But if you and I are parenting in unity, if we are coming together, we are making decisions, come on, before, look, before the moment hits, right? When we're in our right mind, not when we're in the moment, principle, Make decisions when you're in your right mind, not when you're in the moment. This doesn't just apply to parenting. It applies to everything else. Put principles in your life when you're in your right mind, not in the moment. And when you come together and you create and make these decisions together preemptively, then it becomes this, this force, this force that on the front where you're going, hey, you can't separate us. You can't separate us. Can I tell you something? Listen to me. The most important relationship, aside from each of you having a relationship with Jesus in a married couple, the most important relationship before your kids is you two together. And that doesn't, listen, that's not just for first marriages, that's for blended families as well. It's one of the most difficult things that we talk, when I do like widower's retreats and we talk to blended families and Christy helps to disciple women who have experienced divorce, we say, hey, listen, I know that for a season you've kind of operated in survival where you've had to put the kids first, but if you are saying I do again, you are now making a declaration just like you made a declaration at the beginning that you trust each other, you're joining together as, as one in unity, come on, in unity together and you are now the primary relationship of the family. If this isn't the primary primary relationship, everything else goes awry. You hear me? Everything else goes awry. Our kids need to see spouses as a force of unity together. They don't need to see us divided. Did you know the enemy wants to do everything he can to divide us? That is his ploy. Anything he sees where the movement of God is happening, he's going to get in and try to weasel his way in and divide. He's going to do it for the body of Christ. Hello? Hello? If he starts to see a, a body of believers begin to stir and there be revival, right? The first thing he's gonna do is he's gonna go inside to the people within, not the people outside. He's not gonna try to just attack from the outside, right? Because you guys are unified. You're like, man, God's moving. I don't care what people say on the outside. God's moving in here. But if you, he starts creeping in and starting to create narratives inside of each one of you guys where you begin to have this discord and this dissonance, where you begin to go, well, this person said this to me and I, and you start to ascribe motives, I think that they meant this, and how dare they? And all of a sudden, there becomes this gossipy, slanderous, this like conniving thing that happens on the inside that begins to divide you. If the enemy can divide from the inside, he can stop and squelch what God wants to do. He does with this, this with organizations. He does it with families. He does not want the world to see thriving, unified families. He doesn't want the world to see a married couple thriving because when the world sees a married couple thriving, they go, man, there's something so contagious and desirable about that. We're two people who are complete opposites, praise God, (laughs) come together and the pieces of each other, they just complement each other so much and the weaknesses of this person counterbalance the strengths of this person and vice versa and there's just this beautiful unity that begins to happen and they're on the same page and they're aligned and maybe they're not agreeing all the time but they come to a place of unity where they, they humble themselves and when that, when that happens, God, God shows off the magnitude and glory of this unconditional covenantal love that he has for his people. It is a beautiful picture and image. Marriage is a beautiful picture and image of that to the world. The enemy doesn't want that to be seen. So he's gonna try to divide and he will use all means necessary to divide. Parenting and disagreements about parenting is one of the single greatest causes of divorce. Because you can't quite, you can't get on the same page. It actually, can I tell you something? 
We've experienced this anecdotally, experientially with other people. We experience the pressure of this in our own family, if I can just be vulnerable. Parenting in a blended family is quite possibly the single greatest cause of divorces of second families, second marriages. Because it's just so much more complicated. Okay? The most important principle, like you gotta walk away with this, is unity. You see, in Genesis, we see a picture of unity. God says, at the very beginning of time, let us make mankind in our image. Who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? Talking to Gabriel? The angels? No. He's talking to himself. God, God, is it, God schizophrenic? No, no, no. God is three persons in one, the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They have all existed and coexisted together, mutually edifying persons, the same substance, all together in unity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our own image. The Imago Dei is us, us together, right? Now don't try to think about that too much. It will bust your brain, okay? I don't quite understand it. But I do know that God began this whole thing with unity and he planted that inside of us so that when we operate in unity, God blesses it. Hear me? He blesses unity. He blesses unity more than he blesses what's right. Don't miss that. He blesses unity more than he blesses what's right. What I mean by that is you don't have to, together as a married couple, do the right thing necessarily. Because there's a lot of decisions where you're like, I don't, okay, man, oh, there's themes so many different, right? It's not as binary. It's like there's, there's several options that we could do. If you, out of those three possible right solutions, if you go in separate directions, it destroys your relationship. But if you choose one together that may not have been like the exact right one, God will bless that one. Because principally, the way he created things to work is he blesses unity. Psalm 133 says this, how good and pleasant is it when God's people live together in what? Unity. It says it's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard. Oil in scripture always represents anointing. God anoints unity. If you go back to Genesis chapter 11 and you look at the Tower of Babel, God actually said, if these people speaking the same language are doing this, whatever they attempt will be possible for them. He literally said, if they're unified, everything's gonna be possible for them. That's what he said. Now the problem with the Tower of Babel is that they began to do this in an effort to try to become like God and compete with God. And God goes, okay, we're gonna create confusion right here. Because you can't, you, you can't short circuit the way I've created things to work. I am God. Nobody else can. But he actually said, in un if they do this in unity, nothing will be impossible for them. Can I tell you that? That's true of your marriages. That's true of your families. When you are together in unity, that's true of your communities. That's true of your small group. That's true of your church. That's true of whatever, whatever you're involved in, in unity, your business, your, your workplace, in unity. Like nothing will be impossible if you're together in unity. Now, does this mean you always agree? No. In fact, part of the beauty of unity is that you don't always agree. But they're able to come together and make a decision together. And if you can't agree, let's say as a married couple, you're coming at odds, invite a third party in. Christy and I, we have coaches that coach us in marriage, okay? We just started doing this because we needed some, a third party to come in and just go, hey, let me help you with this. The coaches that we have are actually coaches in our ministry. They've each experienced divorce, so they understand what it looks like to bring families together from a blended family situation. They're in this wonderful, powerful ministry that helps people in marriages. And so they understand the pressures of ministry. They understand travel. They understand all the things that we're, and we're going, we need you to speak into this. And there are times that Christy and I don't agree, okay? And we have to go, hey, we wanna run this by you to help us kind of shape a, 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 a unified decision because God parents us in unity. He blesses unity, let me give you a, a kind of a quick hack real quick before we move on to the next point. One of the things that Christy and I have started doing in our relationship, and uh, I would encourage you to do this, is to take a quarterly getaway, okay? And have kind of like a, like a quarterly offsite retreat in some ways. You guys know this, if you, if you like 
have a, an organization that you run, if you're a business leader, I started reading a book. This is a great, great resource for you. It's called Three Questions for the Frantic Family by Patrick Lencioni. I picked it up and I was like, huh, sounds like me. <laughs> sounds like us. We need to ask ourselves these questions. And one of the principles he talks about is, hey, you're running an organization in a business and part of the practice that you do as a business is you have these quarterly evals, these quarterly offsites where you go, are we hitting our, you know, our, our KPIs? Are we hitting the things that we need to hit, right? Are we doing the things that we, are we getting our initiatives, things going, like, are we all lined? Are we all unified? Do we know our roles and responsibilities within a team? He goes, why not function your family like that? Can you imagine that? If you and your spouse got together every quarter, right? You did a big kind of retreat, strategic retreat and said, okay, as a team, what does it look like for us? What's our mission and purpose as a family? What are the roles and responsibilities that each of us carry, that our kids carry? Can I tell you something? Your kids can carry responsibility. Your kids can carry responsibility. You know that? <laughs> they do not need to be like alleviated from all the pressure. One of the things I love about what, what Christy has done, especially with our kids, she's really good with this, um, is that our kids, before they can leave the room every single morning, there's an alarm that goes off, it like turns green, and that says, okay, it's time to wake up. On the weekends, it's like eight o'clock, okay? So we can sleep in, praise God. <clears throat> um, on the weekdays, it's six o'clock so they can get up for school. It turns green when it's six o'clock, all right? What they have to do is they have to make their bed, they have to clean their room, they have to brush their teeth, they have to get their clothes on to be ready. My kids make their own breakfast, they feed the dogs, they rake the leaves. Come on, somebody. This is incredible. What, what am I teaching them? I'm instilling within them principles that are, that are gonna carry them. Now, do they do, always do it right? No. But we're coaching them along in the process. And, and here's the deal. They understand their roles. And in and, and seasons, we have to shift those. We have to change those based on the season of life. But what would it look like every quarter if you just kind of got away? Quick little trip, right? Quick little trip, get away. Have some fun with your spouse, and, and, and ideate, plan this. What does it look like for us to be on the same page? Now you're stepping back into the battlefield in the quarter and going, okay, we know we're aligned. We've already made these decisions preemptively. We are starting this March, we're going away, Christy and I are, and we're starting for each one of our kids, we're putting together a plan for each one of our kids. A vision for them, the key character trait that, that we feel like they need to be, that needs to be fostered in them over this next quarter based on what we're observing, okay? If you had some, this kind of unity and intentionality with your family, what would it do? What would it do? I'll report back to you in November how, it, how it, it's working, okay? <laughs> um, uh, the second thing, uh, y'all gotta listen faster, is uh, God parents us for relationship. For relationship, Okay? For relationship. Genesis 37, three through four says, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. So it, tell, it says that he was favorite. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to them. I need you to picture this. There's multiple brothers that, that Jacob kind of disregarded. Now, the backstory on this is that Jacob, he wanted to marry Rachel. Do you know this story? Wanted to marry Rachel, went to Laban, Rachel's dad, and said, hey, I, I would love to have your daughter's hand in marriage. And he goes, absolutely, work for me for seven years to earn the, basically the dowry to have my daughter's hand in marriage. Okay, come on. Talking about Valentine's Day, let's go. This is romantic. Come on, somebody. You know, amen. It's like, I will work for you for as long as you need to, baby girl. I'm going to just get him to work because they're just prized and cherished. And so he does. He works for seven years. And then they have the marriage celebration. In this day, in this culture, the bride would be veiled, okay, would be veiled. So you wouldn't see the bride even during the consummation of the marriage, okay? So they would have this marriage celebration and then the bride and the groom, they would go and consummate the marriage. Uh, next week, Pastor Craig would be happy to explain to you what that means if you don't understand what I'm talking about. I heard he's got a flannel graph and everything. He'll show, okay? <clears throat> so they go, they consummate the marriage. The next morning, Jacob wakes up and it's not Rachel. It's her sister Leah, Okay? So then he calls Jerry Springer up and he's like, eh. <laughs> you see the dysfunction that's going on with his family? He goes to Laban, he goes, you tricked me, what's going on? 
And Laban's like, well, it's not our custom to give the younger daughter before the older. Work for me for another seven years and I'll also give you Rachel. And Jacob does. Husbands, you pursuing your wife like that. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if I wanna be a part of this family. You know what I mean? Like this is messed up, right? But he does. So now you have Rachel and Leah. Well, Jacob loved Rachel, but he, dis- he kind of despised Leah. And so he despised all of Leah's kids. And, and, and so with Leah's kids, he was ne- negligent. But with Rachel's kids, Joseph and Benjamin, they were his favorite. Listen, the ones that, the ones that were, he showed favoritism toward, that he pursued relationship with, they ultimately, they ultimately had this connection that was really strong. They had a strong relationship with him. The ones that he didn't, that he neglected, they rebelled. You hear me? Because of this. <clears throat> Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Hear me? We put that up there on the screen. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. You, you and I can't press in. We can't press in and press in and press in and just create rules and, constri- and restrictions and boundaries and stuff, although we do need to say no. But if we're just pressing in with rules and we don't have relationship, then it's gonna drive our kids to rebellion. You see, it says that, Scripture says it's God's loving kindness that leads us to repentance. So the way God, he, he, the way he parents us is he is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He's always pursuing relationship with us first. God is not trying to modify our behavior first and clean up the outside. That's not what he's doing. He's wooing our hearts. He's saying, listen, the only satisfaction, the only joy is with me. And then once we step into relationship with him, he begins to put his finger on certain things in our life. He goes, hey, listen, let's, let's tweak this because this is stepping outside of the fullness of what I have for you. This is stepping out. And he starts to convict us. But listen to me, God's voice of conviction, friends, is a, usually a still, small voice. It's a voice that whispers to us. It's a voice that, listen, it points to our future. You see, if you sit in church service or you're reading your Bible or you start to feel this voice of shame and condemnation that points to your past and says, I can't believe that you did this, that's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's the voice of the enemy, the accuser. And scripture says in Romans 8, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you hear that loud, accusatory, shame-filled voice that's pointing you to your past, know that that's the enemy. The voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of relationship woos us and says, hey, listen, 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 no, no, no. It's still, it's small. It points us to our future. It says, okay, well, listen, I forgive you for the past. Everything, look, I don't see your sin anymore. So, so let's just tweet, let's change this, let's move this, let's repent right here and let's move into your future because I've got a great future planned for you. I've got plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I've got plans to fill you with hope and a future. That's what I want for you, right? And that's how God parents us. And this is how we are to parent our kids as well. Now listen, I don't get this right every time. In fact, most of the time I don't. Part of the beauty of parenting your kids though is telling them that you're human. Just the other day, I had to express to my kids, we were trying to hurry out of the house and we're like, just all like, just, it's stressful. <laughs> Let's get out of the house and get on time, you know? And so I, I raised my voice at them. I got really frustrated with them. And, and my words were shame, were shame filled. I, I knew it. I was saying it and I was like, man, I, sh- oh, I shouldn't be saying this. And so after I downregulated and stepped back for a second, I had to come back and apologize to my kids and say, hey guys, I'm so sorry. Daddy got too frustrated with you right there. It doesn't change what you, what you did. What you did was wrong, but I should have never spoken to you like that. And can I tell you something? There was something that happened right there. There was like a, re- a repair that took place. I don't, I don't care how much you've gotten this thing wrong, guys. I don't care how old you are and how much you think it's too far gone to be restored. Repair can happen. But, but reconciliation and restoration is always preceded by humility. Healing is preceded by humility. For us as parents even to humble ourselves and go, hey, daddy didn't get that right. Mama didn't get that right. I'm sorry. I'm still trying to learn this thing too. There's something beautiful that can happen as a family. They learn, hey, I'm not human and you're not human either. But when we do hurt someone unintentionally or intentionally, we come back to them and we repair the relationship. Relationship, it's so 
imperative because rules without relationship lead to rebellion. Can I take a moment, pause for just a second and talk about blended families for just a minute when it comes to this relationship and, and unity? Because I know that many of you guys, you're, you're operating in blended families. Let me tell you a little bit of our situation. I don't wanna go too much into it because this involves other people as well. But, um, you know, frankly, Natalia's dad and I at the very beginning didn't have a awesome relationship, okay? It just, it wasn't like it was, it was just tenuous at best, right? And, and that's to be expected. In the beginning of everything, you know, that's to be expected. But that was just over five years ago when we first, and sat, down, first sat down and had our, kind of our first cup of coffee. Um, it wasn't a very long meeting. It was very short, very to the point, not necessarily by my um, <clears throat> desire, but it's just kind of how it was. Now though, guys, can I tell you something? Five years later, now, last year, he and I both took Natalia to the daddy-daughter dance at our school, swapped on and off dancing with her and filming each other dancing with her. He sent me a whole bunch of pictures and videos afterwards saying, and he, this is what he said. He said, thank you for being such a great dad to my daughter. Listen, I'm not, I'm not saying this to boast of anything. What I'm, what I'm saying is even in co-parenting relationships, even with two very different households, two very different environments, two very different backgrounds, two very different worldviews, like even with that, you can find some unity for the sake of the child. But listen to me, it requires humility and it requires relationship. So when you're talking about a blended family situation, what Christy and I are learning is that connection is greater than just correction. And that for the opposite, uh, see if I can help give you this picture. For the, for the opposite parent, okay? So for me, with Natalia, especially in the beginning, it was so important for me to form connection first with her before I started to enforce correction. Hear me? Because a relationship is really what helps to guide and steer and shepherd a child, okay? Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying this as an expert. This is things we're learning. Same with Christy, with Weston, that connection was, was greater than correction. This, this right here, this is pervasive. This is a pervasive principle, whether you're a parent or not. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So connection is always the most important thing. For you to make a connection and bridge that relationship, then you can begin to establish certain things in your evangelism efforts, okay? Make connection, Make connection. Pray, Lord, give me a relationship right here so that they'll listen to what I have to say about you, okay? So relationship is so, so important. This is one of the principles. I'm gonna give you some, a principle and we'll move on to the next point because I know we're, we're starting to run out of time. Um, <clears throat> is this helpful for you guys? This being, is this, okay, good, good. Um, one of the things that I saw in, in scripture where it talks about parenting is Deuteronomy eleven nineteen. Teach them to your, this isn't gonna be on the screen, but I want you to hear this. Teach them to your children. Talk about them, talking about God's commands. When you sit at home, when you walk along the road, and when you, when you lie down, and when you get up, okay? So these four things have helped to guide me as a father, on how to build connection with my kids. Because let's be honest, life is crazy. It's crazy. So scripture says, here's four moments that if you're intentional about these moments right here to build connection and instill God's word, then, then, then it's gonna be training up a child in the way that he should go, okay? The first one is when you sit at home, okay? What, what, what that says to me is we sit down for meals together, okay? I'm at breakfast with my kids every single morning, and we sit down most dinners, most nights, we cook as a family and sit down and eat as a family, okay? Now listen, that is a principle for our family. That's gonna govern our household no matter how old our kids are. I know that's countercultural, okay? I'm not trying to shame you if you're going through the drive through and you're going to this thing and that thing and this thing and that thing, but here's what I recognize. I recognize that even though I played college baseball, baseball was not gonna be my future. And when life, like when, when, when tragedy hit my life, baseball couldn't be my God. Hear me? What, what, what was my God was God. And my dad and my mom were so diligent and vigilant about making sure that together, no matter what kind of sports or extracurricular activities started to come into and creep into our life, that they were not gonna govern our life. That our life was gonna be governed by God. And it was gonna look a little bit countercultural. On Sundays, Sunday mornings, I went to church. I didn't play ball. 
My dad went to my coaches and said, I don't care. Davey may be your starting shortstop. He's not going to play ball on Sunday mornings. He'll join up with you Sunday afternoon, but we go to church as a family. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And they looked at my dad and they said, you're ruining your kid's future. You're ruining your kid's future. I played full ride scholarship in college. Okay. I believe God blesses. When you put him first, God blesses. Okay. So, so it's important. All right. That we sit down as a family together. When you walk along the road, so when I'm taking them to school, I spoke at Indiana Wesleyan two weeks ago, and I was driving, I intentionally, they gave me a place to stay in Marion, because I was speaking morning and night, late nights. I said, no, 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 I'm going to drive home so I can take my kids to school on the way to drive back up and preach at chapel again, because I want to be with my kids at school. I want to drive, I want to connect with them right there, okay? So when I'm taking them to, I pick them up almost every single day from school, okay? When you lie down, bedtime, oh my gosh, kids are... Kids are like, they're like drunk people at parties at bedtime. You know what I mean? <laughs> they will tell you everything. <laughs> part of it's they're trying to delay bedtime. The other part's like, they're just telling you everything. You know, so it's a wonderful time, okay? And then when you get up, we do uh, devotions every single morning, okay? I model that for them, and then I have them sit down and do their devotions for 10 minutes every single morning before we go to school. Okay, this is a really good principle, I think, that you can instill inside of your inside of your home. The last thing is this discipline. God. God parents us with discipline. Okay, now I'm going to kind of have to skip ahead with some of this stuff because I know we're running out of time. But here's the thing. I said rules without relationship lead to rebellion. But you got to understand that relationship without rules leads to ruin. Okay, you do have to have the tension of both of them. And discipline can be an off-putting word. Scripture says that no discipline is pleasant at the time, right? No discipline is pleasant at the time. Uh, In fact, it says this in Hebrews. Why don't you go to that Hebrews chapter 12 passage? I wanna just read this for you right here. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines, look, the one he loves, so I, you, you gotta hear me. Every, like every day, God is disciplining you. you. Hear me? Now, the reason that we put in spiritual disciplines in our life is because discipline is one of those things where I can discipline myself or I will be disciplined. And sometimes I discipline myself and I am disciplined. You hear me? This is part of God's grace and mercy in our life. Listen, that addiction that you have, You think everybody, it's hidden from everybody? It is God's mercy that that thing gets exposed because of the road it's taking you down. Come on. Somebody needed to hear that today. And it's way better for you to come and confess that. Husband, you you got a pornography addiction? Come and confess that to your wife. Because I promise you, God's mercy is that he loves you as his kid so much that he is not going to, he does not want you to go down that road. He doesn't want you going down that road. It will destroy you. It will destroy your family. You think you got it at bay. You think you got it kind of harnessed and it's just kind of there as a pet to keep along. And I'm telling you, this pet is going to become a boa constrictor that will devour you. So God's mercy will be that it gets exposed. He disciplines you in that because you're his kid. If if he's not disciplining you, that means that you're not his child. Hear me? So his discipline, but his discipline is good. It's fair, it's gracious. And it says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? They disciplined us for a little while, our fathers did, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. He's making us to become more like the person of Jesus. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So here's what discipline does, okay? Discipline is there for three things. Write these down and we'll close. The first one is it's, to, it's there to correct. It's there to correct. God, God disciplines us to correct. Hey, we're going the wrong way. And sometimes that correction can be painful. You hear me? Listen to me. Sometimes your discipline for your kids needs to be painful. They need to feel it. There needs to be a consequence, okay? Now, I'm not here to tell you how to do that. I will tell you that I was raised pretty old school and we're still pretty old school. I was spanked as a kid, okay? 
And uh, I'm gonna tell you right now, it was, it was good for me. And I never understood it. I don't understand. My dad would come to me and be like, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And I'm like, I don't know. Let's, let's flip the roles here. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> like, you know, they spank you. You kind of put your hand there, right? And then it's like, then you get it again. I, I grew up in Alabama. And at the time, they would spank you at school. Come on. I'm going to tell you right now, like, my, I respected the, the school administrator. Res, respected. There was just... And, and I'm not saying that spanking's the, the right thing to do, I'm, and I'm not trying to, but I'm just saying, whatever it is, there's gotta be a, there's gotta be a pain point. So if you're, if you're taking something away from your child as a consequence, whatever it is, they've gotta feel some of that pain because that pain association, it corrects them. Got it? So God corrects us. Um, it also coaches us, coaches us. His, his, his discipline coaches us. Coaching your kids is just as important as correcting your kids. Because when my dad would spank me, we practice this with our kids, he would always, once, once it's kind of the consequence is over, he'd bring me up on his knee and he would share with me the gospel. He would share with me that my sin actually deserved death, but Jesus took the punishment of that on my behalf. And that Jesus died for my sin so I could have right relationship with God. And now all we need to do, all I need to do when I, when I sin because of my heart has been regenerate, regenerated by the, by the power of God, what he made available to me by Jesus dying on the cross for me and the resurrection of the, of, of, from the dead. Now all I need to do, I need to confess that sin to God to be forgiven from that and then confess it to others to be healed so I don't have to walk, continue to walk in that. He shared that with me and that was instilled in me. And I didn't get it when I was six, seven, eight years old. I didn't understand it, but I understand it now. And now every time I'll share this with our kids, we're sharing the gospel because we're coaching them. We're trying to raise them up, okay? And we're going from, listen, principle, control in their life to influence in their life. There's a spectrum. When they're young, you pretty much control everything in their life. But as they get older and as they begin to show trust or demonstrate that you can trust them, then you, then, then you move more toward influence in your life. Some of you guys are in the stage where you're just influencing your kids. Some of you are frustrated because you're in the influence stage of your life. You're still trying to control your kids. Hear me? It's causing a lot of frustration and strain. Some of you are frustrated because you're in the control stage. You need to be in the control stage and you're just trying to influence your kids, right? Well, they just do whatever they want to do. You go from control to influence because we're growing our kids up from, in, from dependence on us to independence from us, okay? The last thing, coaching, is comfort. I'm going to invite the keys to come out. Comfort. Discipline is a part of comfort. In fact, our kids crave discipline. You know that? They crave it. Why do they crave discipline? Because of this right here. They were meant to operate with parameters, with boundaries, with guardrails. Our kids, our kids, their prefrontal cortex is not developed enough. They can't make rational, reasonable decisions. They are constantly, scientifically operating out of the limbic system of their life. The amygdala. They are just whatever is impulsive, whatever is good, whatever feels good, whatever is fun. And it is important for us to create boundaries for our kids because that is where the fullness of joy can take place in their life. That's how they were wired to operate. So they crave it. They don't even know they crave it but they crave it. It's unbelievable, our three-year-old, we've, as we discipline him, he is so hard-headed. He is so, like, if you speak Enneagram, he is an Enneagram eight and a half, okay? Like, this kid just is like, no, it's mine, right? He is like a little Tasmanian devil, and he is controlling literally every step of the process with us, right? He's like, you, you want water. I'm like, I don't want water right now. No, you want water, I'm like, buddy, I don't, I'm good. Okay, all right, you, you give me some water, okay. I'm just right here, I'm going to get water. No, 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 you want it from that glass. I'm like, oh, it just comes. okay, I'll get it from that glass, right? He literally controls every, he is just crazy. So we have to put boundaries around him and he, he gets consequences a lot, okay? <laughs> but man, what is so sweet is every time he is done, you know, crying and mourning that consequence, and he just crawls right up and he gives me a hug. He goes, I love you, daddy. I love you, daddy. Why? 
because in his little unformed brain and unformed heart, something about it resonates with him where he knows my daddy loves me enough that he's not gonna let me get away with everything. There's safety in that. This is why Psalm 23 says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, right? You know, a rod and a staff for a shepherd, the rod was meant to beat off invading animals, wolves that would come to try to attack the sheep. The staff is a hooked staff that is meant to pull a sheep back. Do you think that was comfortable for a sheep? To get hooked around its neck and pulled back? No. But the sheep know the shepherd's name. The shepherd calls the sheep by name. And the sheep don't go anywhere without their shepherd because there's safety and comfort in this. And I'm telling you, guys, listen, I'm telling you, there is safety and comfort in the discipline of God. I can't, I can't fully explain it, but just to know, like, God, I can trust you with my future. I can trust you with what's going on now. I can trust you that whatever you bring into my life, the hardship, the pain, that I'm gonna see it as discipline where you are moving along, you're moving me along the path of life that you want me to move along so that I can become more and more like the image of Jesus. There is safety and there is comfort there. And so that's how we also have to operate with our kids. So here's what I wanna do. I want, I want everybody to just stand and... Um, we're gonna close this time down together, but I, you know, I don't know where you're at with this. Some of you are parents right now and you're just struggling. Like you might be in a season like me where you're going, God, our, our family feels so fragile. It just feels like at any moment, like something could just fall apart. Maybe your marriage feels like that. Maybe you're in a season right now where you're just, you're hearing this and you're going, man, I never knew that about God. I didn't know. Whatever it is, I'm gonna, I just wanna, I wanna kind of give a couple of invitations. So I, I'm gonna ask you, bow your heads, close your eyes. And others, under the sound of my voice, I just, I just wanna know a couple of things. How many, by the raise of hands, you would say, with your head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around, just, you would say, hey, Davey, I, I need prayer for my family. Would you just raise your hand? My family just, it just feels like there's, you know, maybe I have a, a prodigal child or I have a, yeah, raise, keep your hands raised. I just wanna, I wanna see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just spend a couple times right here in different situations praying. Keep your hand raised and I just wanna, Lord, I just ask right now for these folks. I just ask that you, you your spirit would minister to them in ways that they, that they can never manufacture for themselves. That even in this moment, as we kind of take a sacred space to hear from you, God, as we take a sacred space to worship you, would you just come in, rush into their, to their hearts and, and, and let them know that you see everything that's going on, that you are a God that restores, that you are a God that comforts, you are a God that is a firm foundation, you are an ever-present help in time of trouble, God, that you want for their kids, for their family to experience the glory of a beautiful, prosperous future more than they want to. And I pray that whatever is hindering that, Lord, would you just show us right now if there's any repentance that we need to do in our own hearts, if there's any next step that we need to take, would you reveal that to us? Would you show us what kind of, would you inspire us right now? Would you give us a, a Holy Spirit energy, a strength that is beyond ourselves to, to lean in and step in with grace and with humility and with truth to be able to, to do whatever we need to in our families, to set the parameters however we need to set the parameters, to make the plans however we need to make the plans. But most importantly, God, would you just move would you change hearts? Would you regenerate things? And would you make our family new the way that you say that you can? Would you reconcile and restore and redeem? We just, we trust you, God, to do that. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you, if you would say, man, today I just, I got a different picture of God. And, and there's something in my relationship with God that's a little bit awry or askew. And I just want, I just want that to be settled. Would you just put your hand up in the air? Would you put your Amen, amen. God, I just pray right now over these folks that as they see you as the, the good and perfect heavenly father, no matter what their relationship with their earthly father has been, I pray that you would let them see a picture of who you are, that you are, you are a gracious, loving father, abounding in love, merciful, that you are slow to anger, that you want relationship with them, that you cherish them, love them, desire them so much that you would send your son Jesus to die for them. 
I pray, Lord, that they would just, their world would be, would, would just be exploded with the goodness of who you are and that they would desire to follow after you no matter what. Would you, Jesus, minister to them in ways that only you can minister to them? And God, for all of us right now, for all of us, I just pray that you would just speak to us and minister to us. We thank you for what you have done in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing in our church. We just ask right now that you, God, that you would be our Father, that we would be open to your discipline, your instruction, to your sanctification, to the journey that you have for our lives, and that that would be a conduit for how we love and parent our families and kids. In your name we pray, Jesus. We ask all of this in your name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Can we thank the Lord for what he's doing? Hey, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. If you guys made, took a next step at all, we're gonna put a number up here on the screen. Text us, we would love to know. And, uh, and man, we're just excited that for what God's doing in your heart and your lives right now. Don't let this stay in here, okay? Like, like, let's start to exercise this as we go out, Monday through Saturday. Come on, let's be the body of Christ out in our, in our communities. God, we thank you. Would you put your favor on us? Will we see your face? Let your face shine upon us. Give us your peace, the peace that passes all understanding, that guards our heart and mind no matter what we go through. Would you bless my friends, my brothers and sisters as they leave from here? In your name we pray. And all of God's people said, come on, let's sing this together.